I feel like maybe at this point it's best to quickly go back and recall how this all gets done. Okay, so we discussed what a representation is. We, we discussed mutation, we discussed crossover. Um, how, how, so how do things work? We have some folks who are gonna optimize. For instance, here I'm doing a bit string, so I, I have some population size, let's say it's capital N. I, I generate N random points in my space. Um, I calculate the fitness of each of those random points in the space using fitness proportional selection, tournament selection, or, um, or rank selection. I, I grab a pair of parents at a time, or maybe with tournament selection, I grab three parents at a time. Time. Sorry, sorry. I do rank selection, I get an individual. I, I do tournament selection, I get an individual. I do fitness proportional selection, I get an individual. I do this n times till I get n new individuals. Uh, it may be in this process that what it looks like is I get x1 twice. I get x3 once, I get x4 twice, okay? I create my, my next generation. Here my next generation of size five. I should have done size six so I could have an even number. So I, I have my n, n individuals. Um, then with, then assuming that this is just some random order, unfortunately here I didn't put a random order, but assume this was a random order, I choose two individuals, I cross over them with some probability doing the crossover step, yes. It doesn't have to be just two, right? like the parents. You could define some, yeah, you know, we don't have to be conventional. <laughs> we could have three-way marriages of parents, but, but you know, s simplicity, you know, I, I think works well for crossover. <coughs> I don't know. Um, Uh, so we, we grab two parents, we cross them over, we, we then mutate them, and so if I grab two of the same parents, crossover is going to do nothing at all. So you can see, for instance, if you prematurely converge, crossover no longer changes anything. Mutation is going to change locally. And you get your, 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 your two new children, you mutate it, and you keep grabbing twos of your thing, so you get the next generation. You s check your termination condition, run first for a number of generation, of my fitness isn't changing very much anymore, and you repeat. Questions? That's all. Tournament selection. What, given that if you set the parameters carefully, the, the, you can have the same distribution of children as you can in, in rank selection, what might be some advantages of using tournament selection? Well, first, quickly from a, a computer science perspective, um, if you do rank selection, you have to rank them. So how long does it take to, to rank a set of n things? If you're a computer science person, you know this takes a bit more than linear time. It's n log n time to rank, so you have to sort. Um, and, and sorting, uh, or comparison-based sorting, takes n log n time. <coughs> if you're doing tournament selection, and you're, say, doing tournaments of size k, the time to, uh, to, to, to find n individuals is k times n. So, you know, it's the difference between n and n log n time. If your GA is otherwise very fast, that uh, it, it could be significant time-wise, the difference between tournament selection and, and um, rank selection. But there's a more fun, fascinating reason, okay? Which is perhaps harder to, to, to chase after. Um, So the way, you know, it's just unfair, because I've loaded the dice against you. Um, uh, the, way, the way I've, I've um, uh, uh, described a, a GA is, is in terms of doing this function optimization, okay? Um, but you can kind of imagine something slightly trickier, which is still kind of like optimization, but not 
exactly this fixed landscape. Imagine for a moment uh, you want to evolve, say, backgammon players. Okay? So then you're saying there, okay, what's a good fitness for, you know, I have this, these, you know, I have some backgammon program, maybe, in, and, and what the GA does is it controls the parameters of the backgammon program. And so I don't know what's the best set of parameters to use for my backgammon program. Um, and so I say, well, you know, I don't know what the best set of parameters are. Maybe I'll implement the GA to uh, tune the parameters of my backgammon program. Sensible method, you know, really I have no insight in the solution space. You know, the GA seems like a good idea. What you see is a, a potential stumbling block in, in uh, evolving the parameters of your uh, backgammon player that you have to solve. Well, how do you know about what, what the problems are? How could they are? Yeah, how, 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 how will you evaluate the fitness of your backgammon players? What's, you know, it's not like you're saying the knapsack problem where I add up the value of the parameters and I go, oh yes, my solution is, is 43 or my tour length is 98 and a 98 tour is two less good than a 100 tour. What about a backgammon player? How would you evaluate that? Yeah, so you don't have a, this is kind of neat, you no longer have a fixed fitness function. You don't have this uh, objective landscape sitting out there. Your, your, your fitness is relative to the other members of your population, somewhat like people would, would say fitness is in you know, the, the touchy-feely world we live in. You know, you know what, what's a fit trait now might not have been a fit trait 200 years ago in human populations and vice versa. Um, it's relative to the, the environment, and so a good backgammon player might be relevant to a, a range of backgammon. And so, to evaluate, to to create a good backgammon player, you can't use tournament selection or roulette wheel selection, so you can't assign a fitness so directly immediately. But you could play a bunch of tournaments. You just choose three individuals, and you know you you, you define some tournament, and the the selection uh, result is the individual. And you continue that way. So, so for instance, tournament selection you can use in this uh, game playing scenario where you don't have this objective fitness function defined in advance. Okay. Okay. So, we're thinking about genetic algorithms. Uh, we look at more tools. So. You know, idea of genetic algorithm is we're, we're, we're searching some sort of uh, complicated space. This is notes from what? I guess these are all notes from what? Uh, uh, and so, you, so we're looking at other techniques to, that people often use to uh, help their GA out a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the real problem, even with tournament selection and, and, and and things is, is you know, your GA is stuck between two extremes. On one extreme is random search. You know, you've set your parameters and you're just basically sampling a bunch of points at random. And so you're just kind of moving around the space randomly, which isn't the best search method. The other extreme is is you, you, know, you somehow have lost diversity in your population and you're really kind of exploring a little bit around one point. Somehow you want to have some balance between exploring a large part of your space but exploiting, you know. Random search is great. You really explore all over the place, but it's kind of slow in the sense that you never end up searching locally and, and improving things that way. You don't take advantage of your search space. If you end up all at one point in your space, you've lost a lot of diversity in your population. You also, you know, somehow you want to trade off. You want to give some diversity so you have something for crossover to work on, something for mutation to work on in a multimodal problem. If you have a single, uh, 
maximum or minimum, maybe it, you know, there's no reason to have multiple solutions on your space all climbing. Maybe it just makes sense to climb from one <coughs> particular point. So the, the key theme is, is maintaining diversity. Okay. So in general, I don't think there's much point in using a GA for things with have a single minima or maxima, some form of hill climbing or uh, discrete space, discrete would make sense, some uh, gradient based method or other exact method would make sense if it's continuous. Um, so this is a problem. Things end up uh, around one area. Uh, somehow we want to keep our, our, our algorithm in first. And so there's different things which people try and we're going to discuss some of those. Um, let's ignore the biological motivations for now. We're going to ignore the details of the biological motivations because I'm not uh, particularly concerned with those. Uh, but the point is we, we want to maintain diversity in a population and a high level thinking about ways of maintaining diversity in population. We could be inspired by uh, 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 biological systems as uh, you, know, you think of uh, maintaining diversity by some sort of geographic separation. Uh, you know, you know if, if, if things can't all intermingle very quickly, then you know, uh, a successful strategy over here won't necessarily become dominated by a more successful strategy over there. Because somehow, they're in different areas. So um, a common thing is to put some sort of geography uh, where your solutions live. Um, uh, Speciation isn't used so much. Um, uh, two other approaches is, is, is we, we tune the fitness function through a method like um, uh, fitness sharing, which will do this, or, or fitness crowding. You'll see what that is in a moment. Let's look at one method which uh, uh, has two motivations. Um, people like for, for evolutionary computation um, have a, a, a bunch of different uh, individual uh, individuals uh, imagine each population is separate from one another and they each evolve separately but every so often you migrate individuals between the populations um, this is great if you're in some sort of uh, distributed computational network. You can imagine uh, uh, maybe it's between machines, maybe it's between processors on a, a machine. Uh, it makes sense to have some sort of coarse grain way of, of moving the populations between one another. So here you have separate things evolving your, your population, and so this is efficiency from a computational point of view, but then you also maintain some diversity, but you hope by letting things intermingle at perhaps a slower rate than, a, than, than you would if they're all one population. Um, it's a, a way to maintain diversity in your algorithm longer. So like everything, you're thinking about the trade-offs. So if you don't, allow any migration at all, what happens? You're running, in this picture, five separate algorithms, and um, they're not going to take advantage of one another. If you're migrating everything at once, it's like you're running a single algorithm, and you're, you're no longer, hopefully, getting this uh, diversity benefit by separating over different machines. And of course, you may. Uh, You may find the computational benefit if it fits your computational model. So this is just what we said. 
uh, we run them in parallel after some number of generations. We exchange individuals. We set some uh, criteria to finish. And the uh, idea is that this is an easy thing to implement. to a genetic programming mailing list. So if you go, you can subscribe to the genetic programming mailing list if uh, you're interested in genetic programming. And actually, this is the current discussion of the genetic programming mailing list. If you grab the last messages, it'll be about uh, research in a, a island mall. But um, um, you know, I don't recommend this because uh, I think you're making your life complicated. You <coughs> could have your islands with different parameters. I always say simplify as much as possible. Make things as uniform as possible. Um, this is essentially what we said. You know, we, we decide do we, we keep separate islands or how, how, how separate there is a system uh, that is going to depend on the problem. Um, how many individuals do you interchange? Well, it's the same trade off. Too few, it's like doing nothing at all. Too many. What's the, the point? This is something to, to parameterize and think about. I could say there's a single solution. Okay, um, this always generates beautiful graphics, and uh, um, it kind of works, I think. Uh, yeah, I've seen it work. Uh, so this usually, th this, this could be on a, on a machine grid, but people often just uh, do this locally, as you, 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 you uh, have some sort of uh, simple grid, and uh, uh, you set up your GA so things only um, uh, can, can mate locally, and you, you do a, a local um, uh, fitness proportional selection or a local tournament thing to decide how the, the mating works. And uh, it's a way to maintain diversity, yet information will uh, diffuse across uh, your, your grid at some rate. Um, but, you know, you're, you're actually implementing it. You're, you're, you're creating a lot of parameters for yourself to tune, and you're also uh, you're creating a lot of parameters for yourself to tune, and a more complicated piece of code to maintain. <coughs> That's what we just said. Um, we choose individual locally. Too much detail, but for instance, uh, you can read in Ivan and Smith some more details on people that have done uh, this local uh, population methods for, for evolution. But you know, there's a rectangular grid, so you choose uh, make people around you and, and so forth. Um, okay, um, let me give you a method that's. I, I personally think it's easier to implement it and, and fairly simple. Um, you're going to edit the slide. So another sharing function, which is a little easier to picture, at least for me, is we have a sharing function, share, which is based on some parameter C. Um, and um, what it is is Given individual ij, um, given whatever, it's just e to the minus c times uh, dij. Okay, what's the idea here? The idea is is, is we're in this world where we want to. Uh, maintain diversity. Okay, 
So if your population starts to get very non-diverse, we want to somehow punish in a smooth way this lack of diversity, i.e. so, you know, if you're somebody who's the odd one out, you're gonna somehow get a bit more fitness uh, than, than other people, okay? So let's see how this works. So the idea is we want to, uh, I don't know why this is, imagine we have uh, N individuals in our population, or mu individuals, pretend this is an N, or mu is the number of individuals. Uh, so the idea is we're going to re, we're going to rescale everybody's fit, fitness, okay? So uh, uh, the method is going to have have essentially um, uh, one thing which you're going to have to set, which is this uh, sharing function and this distance function. The distance function is going to be some measure of how different two individuals are. Uh, sharing is how you're going to take into account um, um, the difference. So, so all things being equal and we're not worrying about the details of a representation, what might be a natural distance function to use for bit strings? So we have two individuals, maybe we're solving the knapsack problem and we want to decide how different uh, two individuals are. What might be a function we could use to decide the distance between two bit strings? Hemming distance would be natural. Um, maybe not everybody. What, what, what is the Hemming distance? So here, the, the Hemming distance between two bit strings is just the number of bits uh, that the individuals don't have in common. Um, so if there's, uh, what, if you need to only flip one bit to make the two individuals equal, the Hamming distance is one. If you need to flip two bits, the Hamming distance is two and so forth. We're just counting, or, or you can imagine it's the absolute value of the difference. Uh, the absolute value is the one norm of, of the, uh, the difference between the, the bit strings is bit vectors. So we could use the Hamming distance for, for distance. And so what does this do? Um, so the idea of the share function is it's some monotonic function um, uh, without loss, a positive monotonic function, uh, positive monotonic decreasing function, um, such that, uh, you know, so if things are simple, we'll imagine uh, we have a maximum of one and it goes down to zero. So here's the distance. So as distance increases, uh, the, the share function goes down. So this is, uh, yeah, this is distance and this is the value of the share function. So for instance, we could have e to the minus c distance between i and j. So that if uh, the distance is zero, we have one, and you know if the distance is e to the minus n, it's going to zero relatively quickly. Um, okay. So what do we do? Um, so let's say. We have two copies of the same, let's say our population looks like this. We have x1 and x7. They're really close to one another, okay? They're, they're arbitrarily close. Uh, D is D of x1 and x7 approximately zero. Everybody else, x2, x5, they're all over the place. They're not near one another at all. Suppose we're doing fitness proportional selection. So 
d of x1 and x7 are approximately near zero. d of xi and xj for everybody else is, is they're, they're quite uh, far from one another, so it's a, a approximately one. Or, sorry, we'll say share of d is approximately, let me give you a hint, sorry. Oh, really far from one another. How, how will that change fitness proportional selection? What is the, the effect then of using this formula? because perhaps the notation isn't clear. So he, here we're summing over all the individuals of the population. So for instance, suppose this is individual seven. What we're going to do is we're going to divide its fitness by the share value of this um, divided by its distance from everybody else in the population. So what 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 will this sum look like for, say, instance, F7? So the way we've set things up is uh, X1 and X7 are quite near one another. So um, when J is equal to 1, it's, it's a course near itself. So this is 0. The share of 0 is 1. So we'll add 1 here. Likewise. Uh, when it's near 7, 7 is essentially the same thing, so we'll also add 1 there. So, so, so far we've added 2 to the, the, the denominator. Uh, we've said, and everybody else is far away from one another, including x1 and x7, so we just add 2 to the denominator, so x7, for instance, gets its fitness cut in half. Likewise, so does F1, okay? What happens to the other individual's fitness values? So, so they're, they're unchanged. So then what this means, means then is these two individuals have half their, their fitness values. But these two individuals, in expectation, uh, if we hadn't rescaled them, whatever the number of expected children they would have had is now half, since there's two of them and this is half by two exactly, it's as if they're only one person, one individual. So you have things grouped around together, uh, these one person, everybody else, because they're not near anybody, are treated as their own individual. So somehow, if we have a number of people near one another, we kind of treat that as a single point and uh, you know what kind of controls this is your distance function and uh, your, your monotonically decreasing function. Um, seems to be useful, relatively easy to tune. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anything known about it theoretically. This um, so suppose you wanted to recover normal fitness proportional selection. Um, what could you choose as your sharing function? If you wanted to recover a normal fitness proportional selection, you could kind of set this uh, delta function. So if, if the distance between an individual and itself was zero, then it's one. Everywhere else, you make it zero. That way, the only time uh, uh, 
uh, this value will always be one uh, for each individual. And so you recover uh, normal fitness proportional selection uh, by extending this range out here, you start treating these individuals more and more like the more mass you have uh, on that end of the axis. Yes? So by normal fitness proportional selection, you mean like the smooth that selection with the fitness of the uh, Yeah, so normal fitness proportional selection, you would just use the straight fitness. So if we use the, uh, the fitness function, the share function, which was one when d equals zero and zero everywhere else, uh, this value, the sum would always be one. And so the fitness values would be unchanged. Okay. Um, what would happen if, as it, so that's what happens if we put a one here, always thinking about extremes, another extreme, what's the, the, the other most kind of extreme monotone decreasing function we could have, we can make it one over the whole range. It's not, you know, it's as little decreasing as possible. Uh, what happens to our, to our genetic algorithm in that case? What would happen? Some of the fitness is zero. Uh, oh, yeah. What? Down. Yeah. yeah, in this case, uh, right, right, we have to change the distances. I was trying to get uniform mixing, but in this case, uh, also nothing would happen because uh, uh, if the, the share value was, was 1 for everybody, this would have a value of n all the time, right? So to get mixing, we have to play with the distance and leave this similar. Good. Okay. Another method, um, which I used to think very few people use, but I, I, I found out uh, when Xu Yu, Shen Yu gave a lecture in software engineering that he, he uses this method in his, his, his research. Uh, Another method to maintain diversity other than this idea of using spaces is an idea of crowding. And so the idea of crowding is that basically every individual roughly creates somebody near themselves. Um, how, how do, it, how, how do we, we do this? Uh, uh, grab <coughs> two parents, look at their, their two offspring. Uh, each parent uh, then has a tournament with the offspring that's closest to it. Okay? So that way, uh, you're, you're either choosing, there should be a D here, you, uh, you choose parent one and offspring one as the nearest parent, and you have a tournament between them to determine who goes into the next generation. You choose parent two and offspring two, and you have a tournament between them to decide who goes in the next generation. So you're always, when you, when you create the next generation, you're always choosing an individual who is roughly close to the previous one while doing a little bit of mixing. So graphically, we can uh, represent the differences between what happens uh, with fitness sharing versus fitness crowding. Uh, if we have individuals and we have uh, uh, which are, are near one another and we have five separate fitness peaks, we, we tend to get uh, uh, individuals uh, uh, proportional to the fitness related to that fitness peak and fitness sharing. Whereas in crowding, if we're searching, we tend to 
maintain the same number of individuals on, on each peak. Okay. Um, Time. Okay, so now I want to uh, discuss the first half of your homework. Um, okay, um, let's discuss coursework for a moment before we go into uh, uh, details. Um, Okay, first thing I, I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, you can collaborate. <coughs> so uh, you can work with one other individual in, in your in the class and, and produce a joint report. Okay? Um, so maybe one of you is a better programmer and the other person is willing to do a lot more of the writing or, or something. So now you can divide up the work. I encourage you to find somebody to work with and to discuss and, and, and work together uh, on this. Uh, you're going to have a, a TSP problem. Uh, the aim of the first part is to use uh, a traveling salesman to, to code a traveling salesman program algorithm, not to use a library, but to code it yourself. Uh, to solve the traveling salesman problem. Um, I'm going to, at a minimum, I'm going to ask you to implement two operators, one for mutation, one for crossover that makes sense for the traveling salesman algorithm. But you're encouraged to experiment with your own variations of these algorithms. And there's going to be some benefit to do so because only for one of the problems am I handing you the solution. The other ones, uh, you're going to try to find the best solutions, and you're going to, you know, it's not going to be all your, your points, but there is some value in the relative ranking of your solutions compared to your other classmates. Okay, so you're actually trying to optimize. You're trying to find the best solution. You're not just trying to implement and see what the GA does or came up with a number and turn it in. You're really trying to do as good as you can if you don't know what that answer is in advance not quite a real problem we're trying to simulate it a little bit. Um, okay. I encourage you to work with somebody else if possible. Um, okay. The requirements, the minimal requirements will be to run the GA, the TSP problem with the OX and swap operators. Uh, I have uh, four cities, uh, or, or four sets, four data sets, 117, 148, 100, 199 cities. Uh, I am telling you the optimal tour length for the smallest one is 39. So your algorithm better come up with 39 on the smallest <laughs> one, or there's something wrong with your algorithm. But many years I have sang it, no matter how many times I say the smallest one has an optimal tour of 39, sometimes something goes wrong. It's usually not that they've implemented things wrong, they've just forgotten the most common thing that, I just have to tell you this because this happens unfortunately too often. Um, and I don't want you to lose points unnecessarily. Uh, suppose you have a traveling salesman tour, and your tour goes from this city to that city to that city to that city. And you go, oh yes, I've gone to all five cities. You have to remember to return to the starting city. Uh, people always forget to, somebody often forgets to return to the starting city. And I know what the value is you get when you forget to return to the starting city, but you have to return, okay? Um, so remember to return to this time. Hamiltonian tour, not a Hamiltonian path for you uh, computer science nerds. Um, things get slow the larger you go. Um, 
you know, if you just want to experiment, uh, I, I do have a, a problem E, I, I think, on the, the web page, or problem five with some 5,000 cities, but, you know, uh, you know, you have to really think about implementation there, because if it's 5,000 cities, that's, <coughs> you know, 5,000 square distances, if you have a matrix, you know, it, it's not so, I, I, only if you, you know, it's ungraded, but if you want to test yourself on a new thing, I am curious what you get on that, but uh, I'm going to wait a few years before I ask people to do uh, that. Um, okay. So four data sets which you're going to uh, try on it. And no, uh, uh, I think some of these are asymmetric. So trying salesmen, you're still saying, oh, the distance from here is 10. But uh, it could be that if you go that way, the distance is 25, for instance. So we have, have an asymmetric trialing salesman problem. Um, did ever, does everybody remember from last week what the traveling salesman problem is? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you do. And please all raise your hand so I don't have to repeat it. <laughs> so I have to tell you what the traveling salesman problem is. Uh, well, you, you can ask me later if you're unsure. Okay? Uh, okay. So in addition, uh, I want you to kind of come up with experiments. Uh, this is a matter of judgment. Uh, so here I want you to design two separate experiments um, with respect to finding uh, traveling salesman tours. I encourage you to come up with your own experiments. Maybe you say, oh, I don't like genetic algorithms at all, or I don't like crossover, I have this other way of doing it. You know, that's really, I'm going to be inspired by the way viruses be viral, and I want to have the viral method, and you can justify it. And I encourage you to implement it, I'm curious. Um, but so you need to design experiments. I've listed five potential experiments. These aren't necessarily good experiments. They're just ones I wrote down quickly. Uh, you know, you could compare roll-up wheel to tournament selection. You could compare a pure hill climbing approach, where you just look at the best thing, choose the next best one, and so forth. Compare random search to a GA. You could compare um, different operators. As I mentioned, you could come up with your own type of TSP solver versus a GA. Um, uh, I will ask you to uh, submit a, a printed copy of of your your coursework, uh, but don't print all the code. Only the five. Uh, perhaps most significant sheets. But I have you submit uh, stuff by email or through Moodle, I'm undecided. Um, output of your algorithm uh, <coughs> is going to include a vert text list. That's uh, defined in step five, but you should send an email. Um, you should explain the algorithms and techniques used in your uh, experiments in part three, and also the algorithms and techniques you, you use to obtain the best results. Uh, four is uh, something, a typo. I no longer am going to ask this. Um, there is no Hamiltonian cycle on a grid. This is a four, doesn't exist. Uh, five, you're going to email me the results, or I'll tell you how to submit electronically at a later date. Make sure to include that last city. Um, okay. How will I grade this? Uh, your code should be correct uh, in the following sense. Uh, you know, the tour you give should actually be a tour with the cost said. Uh, you should correctly implement OX and swap and implement the GA. You know, just point out there's not one pure GA. It is, you know. There's slightly different ways you can implement a GA that look much different. Um, so it has to be a GA. So when I say a GA, it doesn't mean do random search. Um, so better tours receive more points. Um, your your, your uh, code is, is, is clear. And especially if I 
need to go <coughs> get the code. Um, 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 you can receive more points. Okay, so you need to write a, a, a report. Uh, so it should describe the methods. Uh, this should be at least one page. Often it's a, a bit more. It should explain the operators and the parameters used. Um, you have a description of your experiments. Um, okay, six is quite vague. Marks are based on clarity and scientific quality of the report. So what does scientific quality mean? Uh, I would say this is interestingness and well soundness. So let me give uh, well soundness is, you know, I, I compared roulette wheel selection and tournament selection. I chose this parameter, I chose that parameter, that one did better. Somehow, you, you described exactly what you did, but there's no why. And, you know, for instance, you know, maybe I have a mutation operator that only changes two locations, and I have another mutation operator that changes five locations. Well, if I use the same mutation rate for both of these operators, somehow that's kind of like an implicit bias towards one operator already, you know, somehow the way I selected my parameters should have something to do with the different operators. Somehow, you know, you're giving a reason why you, you, you chose the parameters, not just the parameters you chose, and maybe you give some experimental justification of why you chose the parameters as you did. Okay. Um, why you did the experiments you did. Um, part A, uh, you'll have a similar assignment for genetic programming, which uh, I'll discuss in more detail when we get to genetic programming. Uh, but next thing I want to do is I want to do, I want to discuss uh, the traveling salesman problem or, or potential operators for the traveling salesman problem. But I think now is a good point for a 10 minute break. So let's break. Can I answer your question after break? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to think about the, the due date. What about 16th of November? Uh, the other day I heard that you said that maybe that wasn't the due date. I don't, yes. I, I, I don't want to commit at this point, but I, I will be honest. I'm thinking of, uh, you should start it sooner rather than later, but I, I suspect I'm going to make a much later due date. But. If you don't start it, things are going to stack up. But basically, I'm not. I suspect that I'll be lecturing November 16th on genetic programming rather than before November 16th on genetic programming. And so, if I lecture that date on genetic programming, maybe it makes sense to have a due date in December. But that plan isn't confirmed yet. Okay. Please start it. <laughs> you know. You know, if you start it now and you know your code, you can. You know, you can uh, waste lots of electricity, uh, destroy the environment, running many uh, iterations of your GA, trying to find the best traveling salesman tour to uh, to uh, excel over your classmates. Because you're in competition, and, and only the fittest will survive. <laughs> Maybe I'll just have a tournament and a few fight. Hey, let's take a break for ten minutes. Uh, Going to sign up for loads of Amazon accounts now and just set up a huge uh, parallel program. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.